Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming to this Code Labs talk. My name is Cora. I'm the organizer of the Code Labs Tech and Career Talk. I'm so excited that all of you are here. I'll let you know that we're also streaming on Twitch right now, and we also will be uploading a YouTube video of this talk afterwards. And there will be a time for Q&A at the end. And in addition, we will be monitoring the Q&A and the chat on Twitch throughout in case there's any questions that come through at that point. Well, I just wanna get started as soon as we can. And I wanna introduce Prithvi, who is a data scientist at SAP Concord. He is going to be giving our talk today. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, um, my name is Prithvi and I'm a data scientist at Concord. And as mentioned today, I'm gonna to go over to the talk, building a machine learning and NLP model in five steps. And let me share my screen. Can I see my screen? Cora? Um, yes, we can. All right, perfect. So yeah, as I mentioned, uh, my name is Prithvi and I'm a data scientist at SAP Conquer. So yeah, today the topic would be building an NLP machine learning model in five steps. So this is how uh, like the overview looks like for today. Uh, so firstly, like in the first probably five minutes, I'm just gonna give a background about uh, how I, wo I was introduced in data science and uh, what actually interested me in this NLP field. Uh, secondly, I will then explain um, how exactly like uh, data science is valuable in the real life industry and uh, how it's it has so many use cases and uh, how NLP forms like a crucial crux of data science. And thirdly, uh, I'll again summarize in a short bit uh, what interested me about NLP and why I'm uh, using that as a major part of my career right now. And uh, obviously, the major part of the talk would be model building in like uh, five steps. So, uh, firstly, I would go over uh, explaining the concepts behind how the model is built and all the steps involved in building the model. And uh, after that, I will also go through a sample code of uh, in python of actually building a machine learning model uh, the example which i've used is a spam classifier and after that uh, i will also show you know how you can utilize that model and uh, you to you to predict uh, a spam or something and uh, finally uh, also how we can improve the classifier and you know what else can be dwelled into the addition like in addition to the machine learning models that we have built so that we can use it in the future so starting with the background, uh, I did my undergrad back in India. And uh, frankly, I did not uh, have any knowledge of data science over there. I worked as a data engineer. And uh, as soon as I, like, I guess, after working for 10 months back in India as a data engineer, I just came to UW. Frankly, I had no idea of what I'm gonna do over here. And uh, after working, uh, like after, the first quarter at UW, I still had no idea what I was going to do. It was one of the research projects by a professor, which actually introduced me to the field of data science. And uh, after that, I just love data science just because of the sole fact that I love math, because data science is nothing but just math implemented in programming. And, uh, and that's the reason why I actually uh, interned at SAP and uh, eventually uh, converted to full time as a data scientist. So yeah, let's start with what actually intrigues me about uh, data science. And uh, let me give you a high level overview of uh, what data science is and uh, you know all the different use cases of it. So there are three types of machine learning. One is supervised, one is unsupervised, and one is reinforcement learning. Supervised data, supervised machine learning is that kind of machine learning where you provide the label data to a machine learning model and the machine learning model will then predict whether uh, it's predict or you know detect something or not or like example would be a sentiment analysis model so suppose if you feed a model what positive and negative data is a model will be able to predict whether the sentiment the sentence is you know positive sentiment or negative sentiment or an example would be tumor detection so if you pass an image to a machine learning model it will try to predict whether 
you know it's it's tumor or not an x ray image or uh, let's say for even like uh, a covid uh, like uh, in in real time use cases for now like if you pass an x ray image probably there there are several machine learning and deep learning models which are already built for example uh, if you pass an x ray uh, image of uh, a covid patient or a non covid patient a machine learning model should be able to detect whether the patient has covid or not uh, based on the previous uh, data that has been fed to it so this is how supervised machine learning model or like a gist of supervised machine learning model looks like unsupervised machine learning model is more like uh, detecting patterns amongst the data uh, rather than you know giving the uh, machine you know uh, or like feeding the machine what uh, to expect so for example if you want to predict anomalies within uh, a data set or like uh, if you want to see whether there's some uh, unusual activities going on in a uh, like in social media something like that everything can be done with with unsupervised machine learning reinforcement machine learning is uh, it's it falls more towards ai and uh, it uh, it leads like, the machine to uh, predict the best possible business decision given whatever the data that we are feeding to it so as i said before these are like the current uh, scenarios where uh, we have use cases for data science like it can be used in patient diagnosis fraud detection anomaly detection inclusion customer segmentation and probably even more these are just limited examples which i just could think of and let's well into why uh, like what nlp use cases are so like today since i'm going to explain you how to build a nlp machine learning model in specific so let me just tell you like how valuable even nl natural language processing is so natural language processing again used in like so many use cases so like translation application fake news detection so uh, a lot of times you see google uh, like whenever you get an email it already classifies it into spam or non spam so in the back end everything is uh, a machine learning model is actually segregating the emails which you get as spam or non spam and uh, so it it's really valuable and uh, like we don't know what uh, there are so many use cases which are already running and uh, like also like let's say for example um, positive and negative reviews that we give uh, like when like i am working as a data scientist at kankar and one of my projects was actually analyzing the sentiment of uh, reviews which people give constantly to about the kankar application and uh, i am able to use that uh, feedback to you know for to forward that to product managers and you know translate them so yeah what interested me specifically about nlp so uh, the there was this research project which i was doing uh, like i mentioned before it was a research project under my professor so the reason why uh, data science really intrigued me was because data science has a lot of underutilized application in medicine specifically so i did three projects in the field of medicine and that actually uh, you know kind of triggered my interest in data science or how data science can be actually utilized so like one of the projects which i did was mapping the sentiment affected by ebola uh, people of uh, people affected by ebola in west africa to mortality by region so i was working uh, analyzing the feedback and seeing that whether whether sentiment was low and how the mortality was high in that specific region so uh, that was one of the articles which i published with my uh, professor and another project was uh, i felt this was really valuable which was early detection early detection of alzheimer's disease using natural language processing so how can we you know identify from the speech of uh, the patient suffering from alzheimer's disease you know uh, and map that into early detection or like pattern recognition of uh, uh, alzheimer's disease so that we can identify early onset of alzheimer's disease and similarly like uh, this uh, there was a similar similar project with parkinson's disease as well and actually like uh, nlp was one of the main reasons why i actually got my internship at sap because uh, my first project was actually sentiment analysis of user feedback reviews at sap as well so given that uh, let's start with the main topic uh, why uh, like how do we actually build uh, the machine like model building in five steps and frankly uh, 
it's really not that difficult because uh, like coming uh, from a non programming background even uh, i did not have a programming background at all and uh, it I, I merely started programming like probably 3 years back and uh, i feel it it seems like as if a very big task to learn programming and you know gra- like grasp big terms in machine learning but frankly it's not that difficult and uh, i'll explain you why now i'll ex- so that's why i'll go through the concepts at first and obviously if you have any questions meanwhile if you feel any questions like when i'm explaining the concept just feel free to uh, post a question, like a uh, question in the q and a section and i can i can try to answer it as soon as possible and uh, yeah so let's get started so yeah these are the roughly like the five steps involved uh, in building a uh, machine learning model and this is this applies not just to a nlp model it also applies to any machine learning supervised model that we are trying to build so um, so the process which i'm trying to explain today like uh, it like which is text classification so this is like the general idea of how text classification looks like there are five steps involved the first step is you know get, getting the data and cleaning it so suppose if you get sorry I don't know why it's switching. Yeah. So the first step is uh, getting the data and cleaning it. And uh, so the data ca- data can be data can be there in many forms. The first form would be like example would be JSON, CSV file, any format. So once you have the text, how do you clean it and pre-process it so that you can feed to the model in the correct format? a lot of times uh, people people have uh, like you know concerns or like they g- directly jump to the model building aspect of it but frankly when it comes to machine learning or data science probably 70% i would say even more goes goes in actually cleaning the data or like getting the data in the right format because uh, and that is actually pretty undervalued i would say um, i've seen a lot of uh, students you know actually directly building the machine learning model without you know as soon as they get the data but getting the quality the best quality data is probably one of the most important aspects of machine learning and uh, that's why like probably the first three steps to a year is mainly you know uh, i don't know why it's happening but yeah it's mainly bringing bringing in you know the importance of uh, data cleaning and how we can actually get the data in the best format before feeding into the machine learning model so once we have cleaned it and the next step would be tokenization and preprocessing so this involves more like uh, before we are feeding the uh, in, like text to the machine learning model how how do we preprocess it or you know clean it and uh, this i'll explain you uh, in detail later and the step 3 would be vectorization vectorization is because um, before you feed any machine learning like data to any machine learning model it has to be in a format that a machine learning model accepts it and a machine learning model accepts only numbers so vectorization is merely the process of uh, getting the initial data and uh, transferring that to uh, like vectors and you know feeding that to the machine learning model and this applies in any case so if you have uh, let's say if you have text then converting text to numbers is vectorization if you have images to be classified then images to uh, converting images into vectors or arrays is also vectorization so this vectorization process like is, in general is like you know it's kind of uniform and every machine learning model has to be fed in one similar format then the step four obviously would be uh, training with the best machine learning model so once you have the data clean and prepped now now comes the process of actually selecting the machine learning best machine learning model there is no best machine learning model for um, every every purpose uh, like there is no machine learning model is actually best for you know every purpose or every use case that we have so probably uh, what we what we usually do is we try out different models and see which one is the best model and after that we then tune that model with accuracy and start using that model so this is how you know a rough idea of any probably any supervised machine learning model looks like not just text classification so like given that uh, let's start so the first step is you know getting the text data and cleaning it so as uh, as i said like we get the data okay let me hand q 
do that. Eh? Okay, so Mohammed asked me a question. Hi, Prithvi, for data mining purposes, do you think it's most useful to stick with very becoming very comfortable to Python or build basic competency in languages like Julia or R as well? Uh, so I think uh, this is a very common question that even I had uh, initially. So uh, like I started uh, my co like coursework with R, but uh, over the time working with uh, machine learning and uh, different, you know, uh, languages, I think Python, uh, like you should, if you haven't started, uh, you know, uh, like you know dwelling into one language i think python is the way to go because um, i'm not being really partial to any language but the reason why i feel so is because uh, the libraries in python are really well built and well structured and they are constantly constantly being supported by developers and uh, rather than uh, like in like in some in some libraries are uh, like like the libraries are there, but uh, they are not supported after a while. Uh, so, and also like uh, R is not scalable. R and you know Julia, they are not really scalable. But uh, Python is scalable to building machine learning models, and probably all of the major you know as you advance in machine learning and you go to deep learning, all of the major deep learning and machine learning libraries have their base in Python, like PyTorch, TensorFlow, uh, Keras. So, I think. If you haven't started, uh, then probably Python is the way to go. And uh, if you have started, like R is really good for academia and research purposes. But I still think, uh, like, as 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 soon as you like, as you keep progressing in the field, uh, Python is really the way to go. Sorry. So yeah. So let's see. Uh, let's say how how you can get the text data and clean it. So. Uh, let's see if you if you're getting uh, data from sources like uh, if you have a CSV file or like if you're getting emails. Okay, uh, let let's let's take an example of a spam classifier. So in a spam classifier, the text source data is basically the emails which the server or like the Gmail server is getting, and, and uh, how does it proceed out from that? So the first step, one of the most crucial steps, is the uh, text cleaning and how can you actually uh, you know remove the white spaces so a lot of time as you can see in this example like there are lot, there's a lot of white space which actually goes un undetected uh, when you're passing passing through the data and uh, like removing white space is one of the crucial uh, like things so that uh, like this whole unit doesn't read as one token and you know uh, and like this word is actually being passed by its meaning so removing white spaces is one method of cleaning. Low casing all words. So the reason why this is done is again, bringing the data in one uniform format before fading into the machine learning model. Then removing all non-alpha numeric characters. So as you can see, uh, a lot of times, uh, like there are characters like, you know, like commas, exclamation marks, uh, some random characters. So it's really important and vital to actually Im eliminate such characters um, because uh, sometimes when you're actually uh, parsing the machine learning model, this all like all the non-alpha numeric characters become as noise, and you know each one of these uh, non-alpha numeric characters form as one word, so they actually get meaning. So and they contribute to additional noise when you're passing into the machine learning model. So it's always good to uh, remove non-alpha numeric characters as well. So this is what like uh, the data looked like before and after cleaning. So if you consider uh, like this is an example of uh, which I'm actually going to uh, demonstrate later in Python. And uh, if you see over here, like class ham is basically non-spam and spam is obviously spam. So so this this was the like one of, like if you see like this example how how did it uh, like how did the cleaning work and you know how it lowercase and remove all the punctuations and uh, sometimes it happens that uh, some words actually lose meaning after removing punctuation but uh, I think overall uh, on a majority scale if you see like uh, there is more there is more value in it than uh, losing value and after removing punctuation. 
So let's come to the next step, which is tokenization and pre-processing. So once we have the clean data, then what? So the next step would be stemming. So, you know, uh, like a lot of times uh, there are words like dancing, dance, dance, dances, dances. It all means the same, frankly, if it comes to context or like, you know, when it comes to classifying that specific sentence. So, uh, but if we actually pass the word as it is to the classifier, then probably the classifier or like the machine learning model will actually consider this as a different word and this as a different word and this as a different word. So that's one of the main reasons why stemming is really important. And uh, what stemming does is it actually brings or like cuts down straight like from the end to its stem form. So over here, like it cuts down ing, e, d, whatever, ers and brings it to the dance. It straight, straight away cuts it. And this word is representative of all these words whenever it comes. So whenever a machine learning model sees these words, it automatically uh consider this uh, like these words as dance so that actually reduces a lot of noise and uh, it increases the uh, signal greatly next is lemmatization so how does lemmatization and stemming uh, like differ from each other so lem uh, stemming merely cuts the end end part of the word and brings it to one one common word but lemmatization is more advanced and brings it to, a, to its lemma form. So the a lemma is basically a dictionary based word uh, or like it's an actual word um, in the dictionary which can be brought down. So suppose a lot of times what happens is uh, if we have words like, um, um, let's say consulting and uh, let's say consultants, then uh, and probably consult and just consult uh, consulting. Oh, so it will try to bring it to probably consult or like uh, um, if there is word like waiting and just wait, if there's just word waiting and then the stem, the stemming will actually reduce it to just waity, waity, W-A-I-T-I-N. So it will, it will, it does not always bring it to the real, uh, like, you know, proper English format word. So that's the reason lemmatization is really important. It, it brings in the context and gets it to the actual meaning so that better becomes good, even goodness becomes good and good becomes good. So even, even if uh, over here, stemming would have not worked in this case for geese and goose, it would have actually been like, um, let's say, uh, probably geese would have been a different word, different, would have had a different stem meaning and goose would have had a different stem meaning altogether. So this is why limitation is, more valuable than stemming and uh, we have actually used limitation in our tutorial as well later then removing stop words so a lot of times what happens is words like to from was about on off is they they are repeated so much in uh, the text like uh, because the frequency of these words are so high uh, a lot of times these words gain a lot more importance because their frequency is a lot more. So it's best to eliminate these words. Uh, it depends on use case to use case, but uh, sometimes I prefer removing these top words so that, uh, because they don't really add meaning to your sentence, but uh, uh, they act as uh, redundant noise as well. So I think it's best to remove them. Then comes tokenization. So tokenization is a very simple concept. It's just breaking down a simple sentence into tokens. So as you can see, this is an example sentence is a sentence over here. And uh, over here, this is an example sentence. So this is one token, is is one token, and is one token, example is one token. And that's how it works. Sorry. So uh, this, this again is really valuable because uh, it, it, it comes uh, useful in the vectorization step and I'll explain that to you later as well. So yeah, like I, like I told you before, uh, this is the vectorization step. So the tokens which uh, like were separated out, their frequency is calculated and uh, a matrix of, you know, uh, or like a column of numbers which indicate the frequency of each of these words uh, are written down or calculated. And that forms a vector of numbers which is actually passed to the machine learning model. So we are not passing good movie, not a dead like, uh, like or good movie, the word, 
uh, to the machine learning model, but instead uh, we are passing the representation of this uh, sentence, like one one zero 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 zero, uh, as the input to the machine learning model. So uh, this is why the vectorization step is so important because a machine learning model can only understand uh, numbers, and it's always like uh, like we have to consider the best way in which in which we can vectorize as well. So there are two ways in which you can vectorize. So one is the bag of words approach. It is very simple. Bag of words just means you are simply allocating the number of times the word actually appeared in the in the column, and uh, you just pass that matrix into the machine learning model along with the class of it. So this probably you know uh, like is the representation of this. So and it's it's very simple. You just you see it comes once, is comes once, puppy comes once, and er comes once, and cat pen and this does not come so it has zero 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 similarly like probably is comes twice over here so it has two so this whole matrix or like column is a, like column now values is actually passed to the machine learning model next terms like uh, the next uh, like method of vectorization is tfidf so there are two methods basically bag of words and tfidf and tfidf is much better than bag of words the reason I'll tell you the reason because sometimes there are some words which are repeated a lot. So TFIDF stands for term frequency inverse document frequency. So what happens is sometimes, um, let's say uh, in spam classifier, a word like um, probably uh, email. Okay, email word is probably repeated every time uh, if someone sends an email or like uh, let's see, if, suppose if we are not eliminated the stop words and there's uh, the word from is constantly appearing. So TFIDF plays a really great role in actually assigning importance to these words. So um, suppose if there are some words like um, some words which are really rare and uh, they occur probably just once. So in this approach, if you see, uh, let's see, puppy uh, like has just, you know, probably one uh, frequency and uh, let's see if this is an animal classifier like or detecting animals amongst text then in this case probably puppy just comes once and overall if you see the importance of the word puppy it reduces a lot because the frequency of the word puppy was really less and the free the importance of words like is uh and you know a actually increases a lot so this is the reason why tfidf comes into picture and plays a really important role because TFIDF reduces the importance of these words. Uh, so how it does that is using inverse document frequency. So what does that mean? It simply means that uh, you are uh, dividing the number, uh, like of of uh, you are dividing the occurrence, uh, like of the word the. So that actually uh, you know brings the value of the word the to a very less number. So if you see if you see over here. Uh, the occurrence is high, like the and is it. Uh, the, these all are stop words, and all these stop words have really low TFIDF values. And uh, rare words, like probably puppy or like some rare words which have not been used in any other sentences, they actually gain high value due to this. So, this is a really important step, and uh, probably almost every uh, text classification model prefers to use term frequency, inverse document frequency, as a method of vectorization. So finally, uh, like the next step is training with the best machine learning model. So all these steps, you know, um, they converged into uh, bringing in like the whole data in the proper format that we actually need before training it to the machine learning model. And now comes the interesting part, which is uh, how do we actually train the machine learning model with the best uh, way possible? So a lot of people, have asked me before like uh, like how do you choose a machine learning model or like should i just start away randomly with a machine learning model or uh, how do i get the machine learning model possible because sometimes it becomes really resource intensive so in that cases like i would always suggest start with a basic model and see how the uh, results come come in and sometimes uh, like some machine learning models are actually tuned to some use cases for example um, um there is a like there is an algorithm called logistic regression which i'll explain to you now um so logistic regression basically 
um, what it it's best you it has its best use case for classification. So if you have like a like tumor a classification probably let's say cancer detection. So if you pass an image to a, to a machine learning model and your machine learning model should be able to predict whether it's a tumor or not. So in that case, logic regression works best. So the, it's it's also like uh, some basic machine learning knowledge is actually required for you to select what model is implemented. But there's not just one mo model which is useful for classification. There are probably like three or four machine learning models which are actually useful. So like like or even more like there are like logic regression. There's random forest. There's SVM. So the way you select the best machine learning model is trial and error. So there is no defined best machine learning model for every use case. So it is uh, always best practice to try out different machine learning models so that you actually tune, tune your model to the best performance rather than selecting one machine learning model and you know proceeding straight ahead, straight ahead with it. So let's see like uh, like even in this uh, like tutorial which i'm going to uh, like go 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 over later like i've just tried three machine learning models which is logistic regression naive base and random forest so uh, like i have tried each one of these models and so and i tested out what is the best accuracy that each of each one of these models give and finally based on that uh, like i selected the best machine machine learning model and then i trained it over accuracy so then there's naive base. So naive base is basically a very simple model again. And uh, like, if anyone has any specific questions to like regarding naive base or logistic regression, you can obviously feel free to like go into Q and A. But I can't really go into the specifics given the time constraints because it's going to take a while. So naive base is uh, simply, if anyone knows what the base theorem is, so it works on the concept of posteriori and uh, a priori or posteriori. So given a previous data uh, and given the assumption that you assume that all the uh, data points or like all the variables in the data are independent you make a prediction so that's what naive base basically is and then there's random forest so random forest is um, like in a in a rough format it's basically just a decision tree so what it does is it tries out every possible split amongst the features and uh, um like uh, if you if you see uh, if you say an example uh, would be suppose if you have uh, probably five features in detecting cancer like probably like the size of the cancer the length of the cancer uh, the duration of the uh, like tu like the uh, tumor or like whether it's malignant or not so that features are are you know like the possible combination of features is actually tested out using random forest and as soon as that is done it tries to predict whether you know uh, like a tumor is malignant or not or whether it's actually cancer so uh, i know it's like it seems it might seem a lot to ingest at start but i mean this is how uh, like it's not, it's not it's not feasible to explain all of these in one just one session and then finally comes tuning for accuracy and using the model so uh, like once you have tried out and like tried out different models and saw which one is actually giving you the best accuracy, even within that model, you have a lot of hyperparameters that you can tune. So hyperparameter seems like a very big word, but frankly, hyperparameter is nothing. But it's it's more like uh, how do you change the specific or like the characteristics of a model. Um, so that those characteristics are actually called uh, hyperparameters, and uh, it's that's how it's used in the machine learning lingo. But it's as simple as uh, if it's a logistic regression model, then probably you will tune uh, something like uh, the learning rate, or like you will tune tune something like uh, the alpha value. So those all are like, uh, or you'll adjust the threshold. Those all are hyperparameters, and once you like uh like you and there is no specific set of hyperparameters again which needs to be spec uh, specifically set for any uh, machine learning model but it actually imp like you know it's all trial and error again so in the step four and fifth fourth and fifth you know selecting the best machine learning model as well as tuning for accuracy and using the model both 
are actually trial and error. So it's a cyclic way. You keep on uh, doing trial and error till you get the best machine, machine learning model possible for your use case. Uh, one sec. Got a Q&A. Okay, so I've got two Q&A. Um, um, how do we know if a model has given us good or bad results, especially with unsupervised machine learning? I'm a bit confused about how accuracy can be measured. Yeah, definitely. So when it comes to uh, unsupervised machine learning, there are some metrics which are defined to actually measure. Like uh, it may seem at start that how how is it possible that uh, we don't have any base or like any prior data to actually measure it or like measure your accuracy upon. But uh, there uh, apparently there is some there are some there are a lot of metrics. Um, so let's say for example, um, like there is there is a metric called silhouette score. So uh, like there is a like if you want uh, like let's say for clustering algorithms, if you want to see how good a cluster is, then what what it does is it sees uh, like in each of the uh, like uh, cluster points uh, it uh, it defines the distance between the cluster and the centroid where it's actually supposed to be. And based on that cosine distance, it actually calculates um, like the um, the similarity function or like uh, the metric. So that metric is called as silhouette function. And silhouette uh, metric is a very powerful metric. It's used in like algorithms like k-means or like any clustering algorithm. So there is uh, like there are metrics which are defined, uh, especially with unsupervised, which can be used for metric tracking. Uh, the next question is for a machine learning classification algorithm, what would be a good threshold to have in terms of the training accuracy percentage and test accuracy percentage? Does obtaining more samples always help improve your training accuracy in an algorithm? So yeah, there is no good threshold as such, but um, if you see like uh, there's, a con there's a concept of overfitting and underfitting. So suppose, um, if you have um, your training uh, like accuracy is probably 90%, okay? And uh, your test accuracy or like your uh, dev test accuracy goes, like it's it's probably like 60, in the 60% or like 70%. So that is a very high indication of uh, saying that your model has high variance or like uh, it is overfitting. So what overfitting looks like is your model only was able to learn on the training data but it actually does not generalize on unknown data so suppose um if i train my model uh like let's say a sentiment simple sentiment analysis model and uh, i've passed probably hundred thousand amazon reviews which were labeled as good or bad into that machine learning model and then i probably passed like probably a hundred thousand uh, or like hundred reviews of ebay uh, to that machine learning model. Technically, it should have uh, classified that as a good or bad, but probably the accuracy reduces a lot. This is because the model was never trained to learn eBay reviews or like understand what eBay reviews look like. So that's one of the main reasons why uh, it's always good to uh, have a good, um, I would say, distribution in your data set so that uh, in that case, you know, in adding more data or like adding more eBay reviews to your training data might actually improve the machine learning model performance. So yes, the obtaining more samples all, does always increase your training accuracy, but it also depends on the problem. So sometimes um, your training accuracy as well as your testing accuracies are very less. It's probably in the ranges of like 70% or like, uh, like 60%. So in that case, adding more features will help. So it all, always depends on the use case. So if you have high bias, uh, then, in that case, probably you add like more features. If you have high variance, you probably add more data. How do we code this? Uh, so I I do have a like I, yeah, I do have twenty minutes. So probably I'll I, I'll go over, um, like the uh, a code sample code which I have written, uh, and I will share it with you later as well, so that you can uh, see how it how this actually whole process works, which I just explained to you. What type, what machine learning models have you personally used? I've probably uh, like worked around with almost all of the major machine learning models. Like, 
currently i'm working mainly with deep learning and you know deep neural networks which involved a lot of uh, like it has a lot of layers like probably uh, millions of units and uh, that i mean it's it doesn't matter how many machine learning models have we used it's always like what makes you a better data scientist is basically identifying what machine learning model best fits your use case so i think uh, the this way uh, like you're not biased to using any machine learning model specifically but you should you should be able to identify what uh, model best fits your use case this from a few slides ago but wouldn't bag of words approach result in pattern matching the nlp tool look for vectors it can match in the test set from the training set yeah that's a great question i think because um, that's one of the doubts even i had when i was um, actually starting with the bag of words approach and this is exactly the reason why uh, like this kind of test classification fails in some uh, uh, like method like suppose uh, let's say if there is an example uh, uh, about a like again it's a sentiment classification model about amazon reviews so someone writes this product is good okay so the bag of words approach will probably use the word good uh, and uh, classify that as probably uh, you know a positive comment or if someone says hey hey this product was bad so probably the model will understand the word bad and label that as uh, like negative so the reason why uh, this model fails in some examples is the example like this product is not good okay or like this product was not as good as i expected it to be so in that in this case um, like good again occurs in the sentence but uh like the model is not able to identify that it's not as good you know it does not identify the context because just you know taking in uh like uh the whole sentence directly or like it also fails to detect sarcasm or like you know where people are actually trying to be sarcastic so in this case uh like that's that's the reason why people have started you know uh, jumping to uh, like deep learning or like use cases like bert which uh word is actually a pre trained embedding so it replaces this whole bag of words approach and uh, it it has something called as attention uh, factor so it pays it knows which words to be paid attention to so this is like and that that comes into more like advanced machine learning advanced deep learning concepts so that's really a very powerful way to uh, see you know uh, whether and you know like eliminate double negatives if there are so it actually works that way but i think yeah like even i had the same question and it does fail in some use cases but uh, in in use cases like spam classification where i don't think so you have a you will have a problem of uh, negatives or you know it mainly tries to identify some basic keywords like uh, like i don't know like congratulations amazing uh, you got 10000 dollars you know something like that so that uh, like in this use case probably bag of words might work best but in like other use cases probably bag of words might fail are there general principles to know when it's uh, when it's useful to relevel categorical variables versus leveling and normalizing versus uh, applying one hot coding or creating dummies yeah so i think uh, one hot coding um, or like you know uh, getting your categorical variables is again dependent on the use case um for example if you um let's say uh, okay so let's let, let me give you an example of what i had in my work project so i had built a model which will classify uh, whether a user feedback comment which a user is giving about the product is um, is you know um, like a bug or a ux issue or a, like it's basically identifying what issues or like what areas of um like product were affected so bug, like my classifier model will classify whether it's a bug or whether it's a ux issue or whether it's a performance issue so usually like in multi class problems what people do is just you know classify that whether it's only ux issue or it's specifically bug or specifically a performance issue but when it comes to um like use cases where um, like you know the sentence or like the feedback can 
be complaining about all the three issues. So suppose if a person says, hey, uh, I found a bug while using this product um, and I felt uh, like the experience was not so great and also the performance was pretty slow. So in this case, the user or like the customer is actually trying to complain about all the three uh, possible categories. And uh, in this case, I, I won't be, I, like me labeling uh, that sentence as just one category uh, would be wrong. So in this case, probably, you know, one hot encoding or like, you know, having a binary classifier, like uh, for each one of the columns would be really great. So it all, all depends on um, the use case of what you want to be, what you what you want your um, like mo model to do. Like in, in case of sentiment analysis, it's simple, whether it's positive or negative, there is no in between. So in that case, you know, uh, probably, you know, just, using multi classes or like simple label is fine but when it comes to actually you know uh, the use cases where uh, the input can actually have multiple classes then that time one hard encoding is really valuable so yeah so given that uh, i'll probably jump on to the code um, so yeah so this is what uh, I have 15 minutes. So probably I'll go over this in like 15 or 10, 10 to 12 minutes. And uh, I'll still have like probably five minutes at the end. If you have any Q and A for this tech talk or like uh, for this tutorial or like uh, any other general questions that you had previously. So let's see, uh, like, as I said before, getting text and cleaning it. So, so firstly, like, uh, like don't get surprised. These are all like some, essential libraries that you need to import before actually using it then uh, like like pandas is one of the functions uh, like one of the libraries which i use for uh, data manipulation data cleaning or like getting the data reading data anything then uh, nltk is one of the powerful libraries which i use for the second and the third step which is tokenization pre-processing and vectorization and uh, and then probably i mainly use like in this uh, like uh, tutorial I used sklearn because I've just used basic machine learning libraries, but uh, it, it also comes during uh, like, like when it comes to deep learning or like probably, you know, some further use cases, like I might use like different libraries like, like TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch. So yeah, so this is just importing essential libraries. The second one is a null cleaning function. So the null cleaning function, what it does is if, um, if there are like, you know, um, like if suppose this is the data that I have, okay, then if, if there is nothing over here and uh, then it probably will replace it with any. So, you know, that 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 way, you know, whenever you're passing it to the model, uh, the model recognizes that it does not have any value. Something like that. Rather, because if, if you pass a null value to the model, the model might error out. And yeah, so this is simple reading data and applying the cleaning function. So you just read the data. Uh, I, I use PDs, just I imported pandas as PD. So I'm just using that. So you just use that and this is what the data looks like. So this is raw data, which I'm getting. And, uh, and then I applied the data, like I applied the null function. And uh, obviously like if there were any null, null values, they were all eliminated. Then, uh, then what I did, like I discussed was cleaning all non-alphanumeric characters. So what it does is if it's not between like A to Z or A to Z and numbers, then it will eliminate that. Then this is a regex function, which I use to remove, like it's simple. It, it just removes like the punctuation. So similar to the one which I explained earlier. So, so this is what like now the output looks like, you know, after, before it looked like this and now it looks like this. And then comes the second step, which is tokenization pre-processing. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, hopefully you can see my screen. Yeah, this code will be available to you guys um, after the webinar. I'll definitely forward it to Tyler or something. So, yeah, uh, the step two is like tokenization and pre-processing. So, uh, as I said before, like, 
I, I uh, like I mentioned about stemming as, as well as lemmatization. So I've not used stemming, but I've used lemmatization. So this is a function which I've written for uh, lemmatizing uh, the words within the corpus. And then uh, what I do is, um, so, okay, one sec. Yeah, so uh, I will actually show you. So uh, after lemmatization and tokenization, what happens is, I'll just, this is just basic idea of seeing, you know, how many uh, numbers are spam, how many numbers are ham. Like, so ham is basically non-spam and, you know, like, so basically there are 5,000 examples of around, of non-spam and like thousand examples of spam. And uh, I mean, this, this even happens to you in like real life procedures. Like uh, you might not always get representative samples or like uh, enough number of samples for um, like your uh, underrepresented class. So suppose if it comes to fraud detection within credit cards, like probably there are one in like one 10,000, uh, one in 10,000 cases are like frauds. So, uh, like your your training data doesn't always like or like it always won't be like balanced. So you have to account for that. And sometimes it's always like it's best uh, said to leave, uh, like leave it as it is. And sometimes if it's very close, like probably thirty to seventy ratio, and you know that the distribution looks like that as well. Like suppose um, in case of positive and negative reviews, you know that they can be equally like 50% positive and 50% negative reviews. So in that case, you can think of, you know, balancing the data. So, yeah, I mean, uh, so this is uh, nothing but train, like splitting the training uh, and test data. So uh, I'm using a test size of 0.2. So 0.2 means 20% of the data is um, like kept aside before training and that 20% of the data will be used after we train on the uh, train earlier on the 80% of the data. Then comes like, uh, like the TF-IDF vectorizer. So in the vectorization step, like I mentioned before, um, like I, <clears throat> I like uh, eliminate all the uh, redundant stop words. And uh, so there's this concept of uh, n grams uh, i don't want to go deep into it because it might get confusing but if you have any questions you can definitely uh, reach out to me on uh, discord discord or my email so n gram like the concept of bigrams and trigrams is basically suppose if you have like let's say this sentence okay um so currently when we are tokenizing it uh, what it does is like uh, Go is one token, until is one token, Jurong is one token, point is one token. But as I've said, the range of n-gram as one comma two, uh, what it does is it will, along with it, like uh, along with each word being taken as one specific token, it will also take the possibility or like combination of two words, uh, like as one token. So go until can be taken as one word. So Jurong point can be taken as one word until Jurong can be taken as one token. So in this way, uh, what happens is suppose, um, like I was explaining the bias, uh, like before, like if the sentence is, this product is not good, okay? So not good can be used as a, a token and that can be used as an identifier. But again, we, we cannot really improve, Im increase the number of tokens to too high because if we increase it to probably three or four, then the number of features increase like, like uh, to a great extent, and that the accuracy won't be as good as we expect it to, it to be. So that's the reason probably keeping it to two is uh, really best practice. And uh, yeah, so after you have uh, like probably just uh, fit your whole training model, you have to obviously convert that back into vectors. So this, this is the whole uh, vectorization process. And then comes like training with the like best model and tuning for accuracy. So as you can see, I've uh, used like logistic regression. Uh, Scikit-learn has like all these machine learning libraries and uh, then there's random first classifier, then there's uh, knife base. So these three are like the models which I actually use. So, so yeah, so yeah, like I said, even the class, like um, the data which I'm passing uh, to um, 
like the machine learning model it even the class needs to be in a format that uh, can be accepted by the machine learning model so i've just converted it to one or zero that's it so if um, the class was spam then it's one else it's zero simple so yeah so you train the uh, model on logistic regression and then you see what's the accuracy that it's giving so and these are the hyperparameters which i was talking about so i won't go deep too deep into it because it might get complicated but uh, it's basically like uh, l1 and l2 uh, like is basically like lasso and ridge what uh, like exactly is the penalty that will use c is the value of alpha um, and there's also some other like tuning rates that can so these are all like you know class weight random states verbose l1 ratio these are all like the hyperparameters that i was talking about and uh, but at start you usually use like the best accepted values just to see you know whether the model actually gives some good performance or not so over here like it gave me an accuracy of probably like let's say 94.9% then again in knife base i tried the same it gave me an accuracy of 97% then in random forest when i tried my accuracy was the highest probably like close to 98% and uh, so in terms of metric selection at least i can tell you this like uh, rather than um, make like you know confusing you over uh, like different hyperparameters like when it comes to testing or like selecting the best model probably uh, f1 score is probably one of the best metrics which i consider so f1 score is um, a harmonic mean of precision and recall so like sometimes what the problem with accuracy is sometimes um, let's see if out of 100 examples that you have if only one example is a spam then even if your model predicts nothing okay even if your model predicts zero everywhere still uh, your uh, like the model should be like uh, get like the model should get 99% accuracy so that's the reason like f1 score is one of the really valuable metrics that i used and based on f1 score and roc curve this is what i got and as you can see random first had the highest like close to hash accuracy like it oh you can see 99 percent so so after that like uh you can just tune, tune the model for accuracy and you know add some terms and i created a cool uh like visualization in d3 which you can see um let's say this so this is a visualization which i created to demonstrate you know uh what were the terms which are frequently appearing in spam and uh, what were the terms which are frequently appearing in like non spam so if you can see price claim entry winner uh, free message these were the terms which are frequently appearing in spam as you can see spam frequency over here and over here ham frequency like nice gonna later i don't know. like these are basically normal uh, conversation stuff which people have or email so if you click on price you can see these sentences these are like all the spam classified sentences like as a valued customer and I'm pleased to advise you that uh, the following recent review of your mobile number you avoided with a bonus price call and something like that. And the, like, but at the same time, if thanks, it's very nice. Good morning, whatever. So it's basically normal conversion. So the model is actually predicting decently enough that whether uh, it's like a proper spam or ham. So as you can see, oh yeah, even over here, like. You can probably add like some whatever text you want. You have one thousand dollars. Please claim by entering this in your mobile. If I pass that sentence into this mobile, sorry, into this uh, machine learning model, it is predicting one. So that means it's actually predicting spam. If I if I say um, have a nice day, best with me. So it predicts it's at zero. So it, it identifies that it's not a spam so this how like a whole concept of uh, like you know at least a text classification model roughly looks like but this is just the start i would say but even getting the idea behind how this works it's really important because almost every machine learning model uh, works the way as i explained in the powerpoint presentation so um, like the next step probably you know to improve the classifier would be balancing the data you know but you can under sample the higher class or you know over sample the lower class to obtain more robust results you can implement deep neural networks to classify the data as someone asked in the q a session like uh, like 
like i told you like some attention models will ensure that they pay attention only a certain amount of attention which are important for classification then there is like uh, word to vec uh, models which can be used as an embeddings and uh, i can forward all the resources if you need uh, if you want to learn more about these and uh, then like the approaches like trying to, or doc to vec and uh, then you can e i can even tune like I've, currently i've just um, use like base i've done some basic tuning if i do like do like some further tuning i'll probably get some more best results so so overall it's not that difficult like to, as you can see over here like I, i've done it in less than probably 50 50 lines of code like i've built a simple model classifier with documenting it and everything so it's it's really not that difficult and if you're really interested in this field then you should definitely give it a shot so programming is uh it feels like programming is a big mountain ahead of you but as you start like exploring the field it comes easy later so so i think yeah I'm, that's all i had from my end and like even if you don't have any questions right now like i can wrap up and uh, uh also like if you have any questions further if you think of anything later while you're going through the code or my presentation you'll probably reach out to me on discord or I, I think there's just one question that came into the mm -hmm. Twitch, and that question was asking, "How did you prepare for interviews before you got into SAP?" Sure, I think uh, yeah. If it uh, like comes in terms of interviews, I think um, like I can I can give you a gist of what uh, what questions are really asked in uh, like the data science, data science interviews. So mainly you need to focus the most important thing that you need to focus on are the machine learning concepts so they ask you like uh, what exactly is is like the basic math or like the concept how the machine learning model works or like how do you tune the best model how you choose the best model for the use specific use case so that is one kind of round this one more round would be like a programming uh, round so that would be basic python or like any language like explaining data structures so like arrays lists dictionaries or even binary trees, but it doesn't really go up to that. So, and they also sometimes expect you to know basic SQL skills. So if you know like these three skills, probably you're really good to go for becoming a data scientist. But I think the most important part is actually understanding like how a machine learning model works uh, like in the background. And uh, you don't really need to uh, worry about anything else, frankly, because once you, are thorough with the concepts then programming and sql are just fundamental even if you know the fundamentals of it that should be good to go so like like i, I have some resources which i can forward um, if you really want to start uh, on this career like path or like um, because that's what even i um, used like uh, to uh, gain like you know interest in this path without any knowledge of programming so i think uh, i can definitely forward some resources where people can look into to uh, learn more about data science and you know start building towards it yeah if you could post at the end of this talk in general on discord some of the resources that would, i think mm -hmm. that would be really awesome our last question sure. that i see and this will be the last one before we stop um right. is um is it important to be good in linear algebra and calculus uh yeah so is it important to be good in linear algebra and calculus for EIM and data science? Um, I think, uh, like, even if you're not like exceptional, even if you understand the basics of linear algebra and like basics of calculus, I think it's more than enough. It should suffice more than enough. So, like, data science encompasses a lot of fields. Like, um, it's not just what I explained. Like, uh, obviously, mainly it covers like majority of the use cases cover like. Um, supervised machine learning like unsupervised machine learning some recommender systems but there are also some a b testing which happens and uh, that involves a lot of uh, like you need to be good in probability and statistics as well over there so it, it all depends on what kind of role uh, you need you're focusing towards but i would really suggest like to gain expertise in each domain rather than you know uh, kind of being specific towards some domain in data science because uh, and it's not that difficult because uh, you don't really have to be uh, 
um, a math champion to uh, excel in data science. Uh, but it would be really good if you just have the basics of linear algebra and like basics of calculus. Like in a neural network, uh, neural network is where calculus is involved, and uh, you just need to know how neural network works. You actually don't need to calculate every time because a machine or like the like Python does it everything does everything for you. But you need to know how the derivatives are calculated uh, for back back propagation and front forward propagation. So I think that even that's probably the basic, uh, you know, level of the most basic level of calculus and linear algebra involved. So you don't need really need to be exceptional in it. And uh, how would you recommend a new graduate to prepare for the conceptual interview questions? Please share resources. Sure. Uh, so like I like I told before, I'll definitely share some resources in the Discord channel and. Uh, like, uh, let me know if you have any questions over there as well. Yeah. All right, well, I think that's, our time is about up. I really wanna thank everyone who came to this and I also wanna thank Prithvi for doing this talk. It was amazing and everyone really enjoyed it. Yeah. So, yeah, right. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Kura. Thanks, All everybody. right, goodbye. Bye. And just before we go, for all the attendees still here, we, all go, we are gonna have another um, workshop at um at 5 30 about prototyping so everyone is welcome to join us there too thank you have a wonderful day